So let us worship God. Warm greetings to you in the name of God, the Trinity of Love, in whose presence we gather and whose people we are. The prophet says to us, Come, let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, that we may be taught the ways of mercy and to walk in God's paths. And so we'll sing, Praise with joy the world's creator. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Dear God, through your spirit, you spoke to our hearts of the vision of peace. 
Gracious God, through the awe and wonder of your presence, be our spiritual awakening. We who tend to sleep too soundly, at least in matters of faith and witness, confess to you the difficulty of staying fully awake. Like the disciples who waited for Jesus long into the night, our patience is tested. Our faith stretched to breaking point. Our preoccupations too numerous to name. Our fears and self-concerns are legion. Gracious God, through the awe and wonder of your presence, be our spiritual awakening. We confess deadness, deadness to moments that in reality are alive with hope-filled possibilities. What seems too hard and too demanding is often the very invitation to see a grace already at work that will carry us through. Sometimes we think your reconciling work is ultimately up to us. Help us to wake from our sleepiness and to see you at work always amongst us. Fill us with joy and hope this Advent, that we may be fully awake to all that you would do in and through us. In the name of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So hear then God's word of grace when he says to you, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. It's good to be sharing with you in worship again. Um, we had a lovely time last week and had a life trip to Gladstone straight afterwards. And so it's fun to be back here. <clears throat> now, I want to ask a question. How many children's picture books of Christmas do you have in your house? <laughs> Come on, put up your hand if you think you've got ten. <laughs> I was in congregational ministry for 24 years. And my wife felt the need to buy a new children's <laughs> picture book about Christmas every year. So I know that I've got about 24 of them. So it was a bit of a challenge when I said to Heather, OK, which one are you going to read this week? So she's chosen one. If you want to see the pictures, you'll have to come and sit close to the front. This one's called Room for a Little One. Okay, some people want to hear me. <clears throat> so, you know which part of the Bible tells that story? No. It's not there, is it? It's not there. It's amazing. There's only a little tiny bit in the Bible that tells about the birth of Jesus. But there's so many stories being written about it. So many people have used their imagination to think about, I wonder what it was like. And so they tell a story to try and help us 
understand the depth of this amazing event that only has this little tiny bit in the Bible. I hope that you've got lots of different stories about the birth of Jesus. Now, everybody tells me we shouldn't be reading Christmas stories this early in Advent. We should wait till Christmas Day. Well, Christmas Day is only that long and you can't read stories at all day. So I encourage people all in this four weeks leading up to Christmas, the four Sundays of Advent, to find the stories and reread them and reread them and get to understand the significance of what we celebrate at Christmas time. So I hope you've got some really good books at home. We've got one about Christmas on another ball plane. We've got all sorts of stories that people have imagined trying to help them understand the great story of Christmas. Now we're going to sing a song. And I had to try and find, think out which of all the Christmas songs goes best with that story. And so I've chosen this one. Infant holy, infant lowly, for his bed a cattle stool. So we're going to sing that. And I invite you to keep thinking about the generosity of those animals that welcomed the baby Jesus to be born. And we've already heard about the generosity of people at Christmas time when we saw all those boxes over there of people being generous and thinking about how do I give and how do I show love to other people at Christmas time. So we're going to sing a song and then you'll be able to go and join. I don't know who's going up there today. Ah, there you go. Someone's going up. Psalm 122. 
I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it the tribes go up, and the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there the thrones for judgment were set up, and the thrones of the house of David. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, Peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. And our third reading is from Matthew 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in days, those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an unexpected hour. For the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, for the Word of God within us. Thanks be to God. As I read the Old Testament readings for today, apart from Isaiah and the Psalm, I found myself remembering the visit that Heather and I made to Jerusalem back in 2014. And I found myself reflecting on millions of people over thousands of years who longed for the peace of Jerusalem. The psalmist writes, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Then hundreds of years later, the writer of the book of Isaiah says, in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The longing for peace in Jerusalem just goes on and on. And yet we don't see that peace. As Heather and I and the rest of the group of United Church ministers and their spouses walked through Jerusalem, we tried to avoid the battle between the Israeli army and the young Muslim men who were just fed up with the way they'd been treated. And as we sat in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is not a very holy place at all, really, when you go there, it's just, anyway, 
I spied the sat in the corner talking to our guide, who was an Arab man who had been born in the old city of Jerusalem and lived his whole life in the old city of Jerusalem, apart from a few years when he worked with Caritas in Italy. And I sat and I talked with him about what it was like to live in Jerusalem. And he told me that even though he was lonely since the death of his wife, he was really pleased that his daughters no longer lived in this volatile and troubled city. And I heard his longing for peace, one that has resonated down through the people of Jerusalem for thousands and thousands of years, even to today. And so I found myself wondering, what enables the people of Jerusalem to still long and pray for peace when it's only ever been the centre of conflict for all those thousands of years? Where does hope come from? Where does your hope come from? How do you continue to live with hope? when so many things go wrong around you, when the future is clouded with uncertainty, when our hopes and expectations prove wrong, when we long for peace in our world and we see repeated wars and conflicts, when every group of soldiers comes back from a war they tell us how futile war is, and yet we go into another one. How do we find hope when we work hard to grow our churches and see them declining? Or when we harbour dreams for our children and grandchildren and see those great dreams shattered? How do we continue to live with hope? How do we look forward with expectation? As I reflected on my observations of people, I see there are four main ways that people respond to this reality. The first is, some simply give up on hope altogether. What's the point? You hope and you hope, it never works out, nothing ever changes, so why should I work so hard? I can't fix the situation, and so they'll abandon all hope. And maybe adopt the principle of eat, drink in the marriage, tomorrow we die, that's the best we can hope for. And then when they can't keep up that sort of frenetic pace, they live their lives in a state of pride, in a shadow, maybe even despondent and hopeless. And that's a rational response. Another way people respond is to project their hope into the future. Because we're only on this earth for a short time anyway, we look forward to the joys and the blessings of another life, of a life beyond, which we hope will be much better than this one. Such people often try to close their eyes to their pain and disappointments. They simply bury them and hope that the next life they'll be rewarded for their faithfulness. There's not much point in trying to improve things here and they can become somewhat detached. But often they sound very hopeful people because they project their hopes into another life. And that's a rational response. The third way I observe, this is usually amongst younger people, the third way I observe is the enthusiastic, energetic person who will redouble their efforts to bring about God's reign. 
They believe in God's call to discipleship and they're convinced that if only God's people would work more faithfully, we can actually turn this situation around. We could make the world a better place. We could end all the wars and we could have flourishing churches. If only we develop better strategies and more comprehensive plans, we could achieve God's desire to transform the world. I'm exhausted just talking about it. <laughs> but once again, that's a rational response. The fourth way, the one that I adopt, maybe because I'm old and can't be bothered being energetic, is we keep our eyes fixed on Christ and live recognizing the reign of God is here now. You see, I am convinced that God is still present at work among us all. And it seems to me that many Christians have become practical deists. Now, a deist is a person who believes that God is a created God and has brought this universe into being. But now he's distracted with other planets or some other thing in creation and he's left this world to us and it's up to us to make it better or worse. And about the only point of talking with God is the thought that if we get enough people all pleading together, we can convince God to stop being distracted with whatever else he's doing and look after us. Many people operate as if God is the God of the distance. You know that Beth Mendel song, From the Distance? Lots of people love it. God's way up there somewhere, watching us. A bit like Santa Claus. But I'm a theist. I'm convinced that God is the creator of this world, that God has continued to engage with this world from the very beginning. And I don't have to plead with God to pay attention to what's going on. I no longer believe that God is just up there somewhere through the incarnation of Jesus. What we celebrate at Christmas time, God is present among us, Emmanuel, God with us. And that I am honoured that this God, who is working his purposes out in the world, even when I can't understand it, has honoured me with a part in his purpose. Invited me to be a fellow servant with Jesus. And even when I can't understand it, I have never lost confidence that God is in fact present, that God is with us. So I find I'm able to be more relaxed about my part in God's purpose. It's not all dependent upon me. I don't have to turn the world around. I can't bring God's reign to his fulfillment. I can simply be grateful that has invited me to be part of what he seeks to do. This means that I will commit myself to grow in Christ and to listen to God's voice within. What's my little part in God's plan? Where do I discern God asking me to become involved? I can't do everything, but I can trust that the little I can do will be used by God in his greater plan. My father-in-law, Duncan Harrison, was an ordained minister in the Presbyterian and United Churches, served full-time for 40 years. He was General Secretary and retired, and made sure his retirement date was exactly 40 years from the date of his ordination. Anyway, <clears throat> during that time, Apart from other leadership roles he had in the church, he served five different congregations in different parts of this state. All but the last of the congregations he served no longer exist. We were talking about that. How does it feel to look back and see all that stuff you did just was gone? 
the congregation aren't even there anymore. How do you feel when you can't see any evidence for what you did? And as we talked about it, we realised that even if some institutional expression of the church has disappeared, it doesn't negate the impact on thousands of people's lives where God used him to touch them, to offer grace and love and hope. Part of the struggle for us is we like to see the visible results of what we do. We like to see somehow that we've achieved something. It's my argument about why so many ministers have hobbies of making things. Because at least at the end of it, you can say, oh, look, I did that. Whereas at the end of the sermon, you don't know whether it's cheating. I admire teachers for that. They front up at the beginning of the year, they give a bunch of kids to look after for a whole year. They do their best for that bunch of kids, and then those kids go and they get another lot the next year. And they have no idea what their impact has been. And mostly, they never ever get to see how that child turned out as an adult. Somehow, we are called to serve Christ and look for hope and encouragement within, not out there. We, it's why we come together in worship. We actually come together to remind one another who God is. To remind one another to whom we belong. To confess together, God, when we think about who you are, we've made a mess sometimes. And to hear God say to us, this is what I really want you to do. Now, I've been told thousands of times. I don't have to go to worship, go to church to worship God. I can worship God under a tree. I'm surprised there aren't more greenies because if all the people have told me that they worship God under a tree did so, we'd have a lot more trees would be needed. And it's true. You can worship God perfectly well under a tree. <coughs> the problem with it is that we lose hope. We find ourselves isolated and cut off. And so the community of the church is about encouraging one another and affirming one another and knowing, and knowing that we all go through those times of doubt and uncertainty where we're not sure that this faithful serving of God is getting anywhere, when every time we think we've taken a few steps forward, we hear another report of another war, or more people that are homeless, or more people living with violence. It's then that we need to recognise that God is gracious and it's within that we discover. We can become discouraged if we keep looking for external evidence that our work has been worthwhile. We need to find that in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We need to listen deeply to God's Spirit if we're to hear God's affirmation. And we need to be open to the little signs of God's presence and affirmation that will sustain us. I want to show you a couple of photos. Can you put the first one up? There. <clears throat> Some of you might recognise that. That's at the top of the range, if you go up to the lane from Landsborough. Opposite the big barrel, that's what you see. A tank, a broken down fence, a couple of gates, a dirty great big power pole. We drive past their lots. We know it well. Then one morning, we're actually in fact travelling from Mulaney down to share and worship with the people of Richardor. Heather saw this next photo. Heather saw that. And she said, stop. And I obediently stopped and she took that photo out of the car door. We have 
been passed there, we've seen that place lots of times. But we've never seen that before, and we've never seen it since. And Heather said, look, the light's breaking through. We should make that the theme of our Advent retreat. And so yesterday, a bunch of people came to our place, and we talked about the light breaking through. Where is the light breaking through? Because when I'm doing things, I get focused on the goal, I could easily have said that day, no, I haven't got time to stop, and kept going. <coughs> and we would never have that memory. We would never have that reminder that even amongst all the clutter that's actually there, the light was breaking through. Advent can be a time of clutter. All sorts of things we do at this time of year. And we can miss the hope that God seeks to show us in the little things, in the simple things, in the words of encouragement, in a big pile of boxes over there from young people who say, we want to do something for someone else. We can miss the signs of God's grace because of all the clutter and noise that goes on around us. We can be so busy, even focused on trying to do what we think God wants us to do, that we don't hear the word of hope and affirmation. Like the people who continue to pray for and to hope for and to search for peace in Jerusalem. We can be people of hope. Not a blind hope that simply says, well, it's, it's way out there beyond. We can see the signs of hope around us. And we can listen to what God says to us within us. So whether we realize it or not, we become signs of a light breaking through in the lives of others. That's why God's recruited us. That's why God's invited us to follow Jesus Christ. To be the signs of life, of new life, of hope-filled life, and of joy. As you go into this Advent season, keep looking out for the signs of the light breaking through. Draw your joy and strength from those moments. And keep faithfully doing the things that you sense God asking you to do. And to trust that in his own amazing way, he's going to make signs of life throughout the world. Amen. So the only song I could think of singing after that was the song, Christ be our light. Shine in our hearts, shine through the dark. We come before you, O oh God, knowing that our hearts and hands don't always work in one accord. <laughs> our intentions and our actions often contradict one another. And yet we come again and bring with us our willing offerings of service, giftedness, time and money. By your Spirit, bless all that we offer, gracious God. Today we are mindful of those who exist without hope. Those who have little reason to wake expecting in the morning and those who struggle to offer a word of thanks at night. And so we say, Christ of all people, come let your hope reign in and through us that others might find you hope. We think of it indigenous communities in this land where hopeless, hopelessness born of displacement, lost identity, unemployment and lack of purpose have created a dependence on unhealthy ways of life 
and of damaged relationships. Our prayer is for real and lasting change within such communities and systemic and political change in the wider community. We think of refugees fleeing war and unspeakable violence, desperately seeking safety and a hope-filled life, maybe here in Australia or even in many other places around the world. Millions who have fled beloved homelands and families because it was hopeless. Our prayer is for their future. An opportunity for freedom, health, income and simple human dignities that most of us take for granted. May they find a welcome and grace, especially by people of faith and hope. Christ, let your reign bring hope. We think of people who this Advent find it hard to sense your presence in their lives. Those trying to cope with unspeakable grief. Those facing major surgery or recovering from it. Those torn apart by family conflict and violence. Those for whom every day just feels dull and struggles. Our prayer is that they might find healing and wholeness, a way to live in hope and surrounded by hope and love. We pray that this season of new life might indeed bring new life to those who desperately need a hopeful future. Christ of all people, let your hope reign in and through us. Draw us closer to yourself that we might find ourselves shaped in the fullness of Christ. And we join with all those who've sought to follow him down through the centuries and share the prayer that he gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So as we conclude, I invite you to stand if you're able and sing the voice of God goes out to all the world.
and his grace, his love and mercy is sufficient all that he asked. Amen. Amen.